I invite you to remain standing as we hear today's gospel lesson from the Gospel of Mark. When Jesus and his followers approached Jerusalem, they came to Bethpage and Bethany at the Mount of Olives. And Jesus gave two disciples a task, saying to them, Go into the village over there, and as soon as you enter it, you will find tied up there a colt that no one has ridden. Untie it and bring it here. If anyone says to you, why are you doing this? Say, it's the master who needs it, and he will send it back right away. They went and they found a colt tied to a gate outside on the street, and they untied it. Some people who were standing around said to them, what are you doing untying that colt? And they told them just what Jesus said, and they left them alone. They brought the colt to Jesus and threw their clothes upon it, and he sat on it. And many people spread out their clothes on the road, while others spread branches cut from the fields. Those in front of him and those following him were shouting, Hosanna! Blessed is the one who comes in the name of the Lord. Blessings on the coming of the kingdom of our ancestor David. Hosanna in the highest. And Jesus entered Jerusalem and went into the temple. And after he looked around at everything, because it was already late in the evening, he returned to Bethany with the twelve. This is the word of God for us, the people of God. Thanks be to God. Amen. You may be seated. Well, some stories just leave me spellbound. Some stories that just strike me with awe, and I replay them over and over in my mind, and the feelings that those stories stirred up in me come alive over and over again. I think, for instance, about that beautiful scene in The Wizard of Oz when Dorothy and the Tin Man and the Cowardly Lion are coming out of the meadow, the forest, and they see the Emerald City for the first time and they just start skipping and singing. It just makes me feel happy. And I think about that scene at the beginning of The Sound of Music when Julie Andrews is twirling around and she's singing, the hills are alive with the sound of music. And the scene is so beautiful, and it just fills my heart with joy. The scene on Palm Sunday is also one of those scenes that fills my heart with joy. As I think about the people lining the street, coming out to meet Jesus, and waving the palm branches as Jesus rides on that donkey and that beautiful chorus, Hosanna, Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. There was, and indeed there still is, something that draws people to Jesus, that draws people to want to see and know and understand who Jesus is, Something about Jesus that just attracts us to him. All these many years later, people are still wondering, who is this Jesus? Many of you have seen the ad campaigns, He Gets Us. It's an ad campaign that is seeking to help people understand who Jesus is. And understand that Jesus knows us and understands us. Something compelling about Jesus that attracts us to him. It has been ever since his birth when the humble shepherds were drawn to the manger to see Jesus, when the learned magi traveled far to meet this newborn king. When Jesus was a boy in the temple, you remember how the rabbis and the priests were attracted to him and spent time with him discussing the scriptures. 
And you remember when he emerged on the public scene after his baptism, people were drawn to him as almost as if he became an overnight sensation with crowds of people gathering around him, people from all walks of life, from fishermen to tax collectors to religious leaders like Nicodemus, respectable women like Mary and Martha, and women with questionable backgrounds like the Samaritan woman that he spoke with at the well. And even little children were attracted to Jesus as they ran to him and wanted to sit on his lap and receive a blessing from this man. Have you ever wondered why Jesus has always been so attractive to people? The scriptures tell us that he wasn't especially a handsome man. His parents were not prominent people in the community. They didn't have big jobs and big roles and status in the community. His father was a carpenter. He had no money. The scriptures tell us that the Son of Man had no place to lay his head. He didn't own property or a house. So what was so special about Jesus? The pursuit of that question has filled volumes of books as people try to understand who is Jesus. The historical Jesus, the religious leader Jesus, the teacher Jesus. Last year during Lent, we did a whole sermon series on looking at Jesus and understanding Jesus as our teacher, Jesus as our redeemer, Jesus as our Lord. We looked at Jesus as the good shepherd, Jesus as the vine, Jesus as the sheep gate. We explored over and over again different ways of understanding Jesus. And so, why do I even dare to stand before you today and try to preach a sermon that answers the question, who is Jesus? And expect to get you out of church on time to eat lunch, right? I know. It's a hazard of preachers, and I'm trying to get better, but it's a hazard of preachers to always realize that there's more to say than we have time to say it. And so the best that I can do today is simply probe the truth a little bit about who Jesus is. The best I can do is start to paint a picture for you of who Jesus is in our world today and hopefully pull you in with the stories and the illustrations that I share with you today. Hopefully pull you in so that you, in your hearts and in your minds you will begin to explore this question in much more depth on your own. That beyond this time of worship, in your own personal time of prayer and devotions and reflections and encounters with others this week, you will begin to know a little bit more about who Jesus is. So I want to begin by putting this truth right at the front of our minds. The fundamental fact about our faith the faith that we call Christianity. First and foremost, it is a religion about God, God our creator. Christianity is not primarily a new ethic. It's not just a gospel of brotherly love and acceptance and the golden rule, doing unto others as we would have them do unto us. It's not mainly a philosophy of life or a social justice program. Doubtless, Christianity involves all of those ethics. But at its core, Christianity is a message about who God is and who we are. It's a message that the living God, eternal, immortal, invincible, came to earth, broke to earth in an unprecedented way, and once and for all became flesh and blood 
in the final revelation of God's self to us in the man we know as Jesus of Nazareth. That's who Jesus is, God with us, Emmanuel. Now, why is that so important? I believe it's important for us to start there because at a very deep and personal level for each one of us, Jesus embodies for us hope in the promises. The promises of healing and wholeness, forgiveness and love. That's the kind of hope that I believe the ancient Jews on that first Palm Sunday felt as they remembered the words of the prophet Zechariah who said that a Messiah, a Savior would come. A Savior would come and in that Savior they would see the truth of the hope that they had the hope that they had of being saved from illness and poverty and oppression. The hope. That's what the word Hosanna means. It means save us. Save us. Save us from illnesses. Save us from the things that are unjust in this world. Save us from oppression. Save us from despair. Save us from our sins. Hosanna. Loud Hosanna. The masses who followed Jesus long ago believed that Jesus would fulfill those promises that they hoped for. Hope. That's why I believe Jesus is so attractive even today. The hope that every one of us has for a better world, a place where illnesses are no more, where healing and wholeness, forgiveness and love is available to all. Several years ago, a school teacher accepted a volunteer position of visiting children in a local hospital. One day, the phone call rang and she received her very first assignment to come to the hospital and she was told that she needed to teach this little boy about nouns and adverbs. So the teacher went to the hospital. It was the first time she'd been there. And when she arrived at the hospital and looked at the room number where the little boy was supposed to be, she realized that this little boy was on the burn unit of the hospital. Now she was prepared to teach the child about nouns and adverbs, but she was not prepared for the horrible look and smell of badly burned human flesh. She wanted to turn and walk away. She wanted to hold her nose as she walked down the hallway. She wanted to leave more quickly than she had entered the hospital, but she knew she couldn't. So she walked into the little boy's room clumsily and yet she walked to the side of his bed and she introduced herself. She said, I'm the hospital teacher and I was sent here by your school teacher to teach you about nouns and adverbs. So I'm going to come by every day and we're going to work on your English grammar. The next morning, when the teacher came back to teach the little boy for the second day, a nurse stopped her in the hallway and she said, excuse me, before you go in, I want to know what did you do to that little boy yesterday? And the substitute teachers, oh, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. I know I must have done something wrong. I was just, but before she could finish, the nurse said, no, 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 you don't understand. We were all worried about that little boy. It was like he had given up. He didn't want to do what the doctors were telling him to do. He didn't want to take his medicine. He didn't want us to change his dressings. He was despondent. It was like he had given up all hope and he just thought he was going to die. But after you left yesterday, 
He started doing things for us. He started being compliant. It was almost as if he decided he wanted to live. Hope, my friends. Hope. That nurse went into the little boy's room later that day and asked the little boy, what was it that made you change when you saw that teacher? And the little boy said, well, I had figured I was doomed. I knew that I was going to die with all these burns. But then I thought, they wouldn't send a teacher in here to teach a dying boy about nouns and adverbs, would they? And so I knew I wasn't going to die. Hope. You know, we often say in our world that to live is to hope. But that little boy reminds us that to hope is to live. We need to have hope in order to fully live our lives. And Jesus brings us that hope. Jesus brings us the hope that we need, the hope in a better life and in a better world. Jesus is the one who saves us from the things that destroy our hope. Jesus is the hope, the hope of a better world. So if hope is what attracted the people to Jesus, why in a few short days did they turn against Jesus? And why do so many people in our world today give up on Jesus? and turn their backs on Jesus? What is it that stops the cheering and the shouts of Hosanna? I think it's because we don't truly understand what Jesus comes to bring to us. We don't truly understand who Jesus is. As I read over the scriptures, one of the most prominent reasons revealed for why the crowds turned against Jesus is that Jesus dared to suggest that all people are worth loving. Recall how over and over again those who opposed Jesus were bothered and put off by the way that Jesus ate with tax collectors and sinners. And how often on the Sabbath day, he would reach out and heal people who were afflicted, putting the needs of people above the letter of the law. Jesus dared to suggest that all people are worth loving. And that is difficult truth, not only for us to hold on to, but for us to live out in our own lives. For Jesus calls us not to a set of beliefs, but to follow him, to do what he did, to live and to love the way he lived and loved. And that's not easy for us to do, is it? Lou Marsh was a young man who grew up in the ghetto of Philadelphia. He received a scholarship from Temple University. He did well. He graduated cum laude. He decided he wanted to go into the ministry, and he was accepted into Yale Divinity School. But during the first year as he went through the courses there, he thought, hmm, maybe I'm not really cut out to be a pastor. It's a hard calling. But he knew he wanted to be a disciple of Jesus Christ, but he wasn't sure he wanted to pastor a church. So he dropped out of seminary, and he went to New York City, and he took a job with the New York City Youth Authority. He was assigned to work with young people who were part of a gang in East Harlem. The gang was called the Young Untouchables. 
And he worked and he worked and he worked with them and he got them off the streets and he got them out of the gang wars that were going on. But one night he received a phone call and the phone call was from his supervisor. His supervisor told him that the young untouchables were off and ready to get into a rumble with a rival gang. And so he jumped out of bed, he got on the subway, and he went downtown to East Harlem. He was able, through his relationships with those boys, to stop the clash. He talked to the leaders of the gangs, both gangs, and the boys went home, and he was able to go on his way. But as he started back towards his house, he himself was attacked. He was attacked by some disgruntled young men who had once been part of the young untouchables and who wanted the young untouchables to be out there and to be fierce and violent again. They wanted that war to occur and Lou was the only reason it stopped in their minds. They fought and they beat him up and they left Lou on the street unconscious. Two days later, Lou died of a hemorrhage. Just a month before, Lou had traveled back to his home in Philadelphia to visit his parents and his parents had tried earnestly to get him to leave that youth authority and to go back to seminary in Philadelphia. And Lou had actually promised his parents that at the end of the year he would do just that. He would go back to Yale and he would finish his degree. His parents said, oh, we're so glad because we're concerned about your safety in New York City with working with those gangs. We don't like you working with gangs. And he said two things to his parents before he left. He said, Mom, Dad, I'm going to be all right. And secondly, somebody has to do what I'm doing. Somebody has to be concerned about these young people about these dispossessed and powerless young people who are at the bottom of most people's thoughts and in their minds at the bottom of society. And remember how Jesus said, whoever receives the least among us receives me. My friends, I share that sobering story with you today because I believe that Lou Marsh embodied the Palm Sunday faith that challenges us. Calling Jesus our King and our Lord is easy to do with our mouth and with our lips, but actually following King Jesus is not always easy. So how do we get the power? the power to follow Jesus. A friend of mine, Frank Manning, shared with me the following story from his father's preaching records. It's a story of John and Margie Cooper. John had married in 1941, he and Margie. At that time, he said Margie was a sturdy, sprightly woman with lots of energy and they settled in on high hopes of becoming the country's biggest onion farmers but four years later after bearing two children Margie developed polio She spent the rest of her life bedridden in an iron lung. But what about John? Well, gone were all the payoffs that John thought he had in marrying a strong and energetic wife. 
No longer was there someone to help him keep the house. No longer was there someone to share his bed. No longer was there someone to help him rear their two children. No longer did he have high hopes of having a big onion farm. For you cannot compete in the big leagues with onion farming when you're trying to do it alone and take care of a wife with polio. So John and Margie Cooper had their 40th wedding anniversary and someone came to John and they asked him to explain his long devotion to Margie. Only four years of their marriage were without polio. And John said this, I'm a Christian and we try to keep our promises and besides, I love her. A few years later, when Margie died, their son Dale asked John how he had done what he had done for all those years. And John said, I never thought about doing anything else. You just do it. And God helps you. God helps you. My friends, that's the Palm Sunday faith, the faith and belief in a Savior, the one who saves us from despair and gives us the energy and the strength and the courage to live following in the footsteps of love. May we each have the faith and the courage so to live. In the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, amen.